Welcome to Beyond the Office. I'm your host, Bill Keller, where we talk about leading and building remote teams. And on today's episode, we have Alex Zerbicki, a seasoned business advisor with Cultivate Advisors, specializing in providing strategic guidance to business owners seeking to optimize their enterprise value. As a part of Cultivate Advisor team, Alex brings a wealth of experience and expertise to the table. With a focus on fostering economic equality and sustainability, Alex collaborates closely with small and medium-sized businesses to develop and implement custom strategies that drive success. His role extends beyond traditional advisory services, delving into the realms of mindset, consciousness, communication, and holistic business optimization. By dismantling monopolies and empowering businesses at a grassroots level, Alex plays a crucial role in advancing the mission of economic empowerment and prosperity for the broader business community. It's great to have you on the show, Alex. Uh, likewise, I'm very happy to be here. Been a long time, happy to catch up too. Yeah, it's been a been a, too long actually. Alex actually came to visit me in Columbia one time, I think it was last year, and he got to explore with his, his uh, now wife. So hopefully everything's going well. I think you moved and uh, you're living in Texas now. Where are you? Are you in Dallas or are you in Austin? I'm in Fort Worth, just oh. outside of Dallas. My wife and I, our one year anniversary is on Monday. So we're coming up on exactly one year of marriage. We visited you shortly before we actually were there for her birthday in uh, in 2022. And uh, very gracious host. We still talk about that trip all the time. Well, it's great to have you here. So I know you're doing lots of stuff and you're always incredibly busy. You know, I know you have a full slate of uh, clients, but just curious, you know, how did you get into consulting and like what began this journey for you? Yeah, I was trained in college in finance. I thought I wanted to be a Wolf of Wall Street type, you know, go go trade on the floor and make millions and fly helicopters and whatnot. But uh, I, I started in investment banking and realized very quickly that I didn't like the monotony. I didn't like the folks I was serving. Moved over to private equity. A lot of similar feedback there. Private equity spun out into franchising for me. The company that I was working for became a franchisor. And um, that was the first time that I was introduced to small business. I had only been concerned with, you know, big portfolios, large institutions, and the the small business owner, the entrepreneur, really captivated my interest. And, and I found some role models in in modeling and selling franchises for this for this franchisor. And over time, that morphed into me being fully entrepreneurial and me gradually serving smaller and smaller businesses. And now we're in we're in mid to mid market to small market businesses. And it just seems like the folks who will take the risk and bet on themselves to start or buy a business, those are the type of people I want to hang out with. The people who who have that leg drive and that interest in kind of exploring and building themselves. And additionally, I believe that small business and medium-sized business, that kind of sector, they're the fabric of economic growth and community and stability. And so, like you graciously mentioned in, in the, the lead in there, like I, I tell myself that I'm fighting big business, I'm fighting monopoly by helping small to mid-market businesses succeed. And so that's, that's what drew me over many years in my adult life to the consulting that I'm doing now and, and helping these folks. And I can tell you, you do a great job at that. Alex was my advisor for a while, and uh, you know his insights were really profound in our business, and it really helped to take us to the to another level. And so I can speak to you know your expertise in this area and how you've been able to help. Uh, I know me and other people. So how many businesses do you typically work with at any one time? Yeah, we do. We do fully custom engagements, right? So you know I, I go really deep with some folks and, and I'm more of a 30,000 foot advisory level with others, but anywhere from 15 to 20 is is a, a full slate depending on, on depth and scope of work. You know, I, one of the reasons that I love my job is that it's not monotonous. Each individual business, as you know, presents a unique set of constraints, hopes and dreams, resources, and being able to toggle between those different problems throughout the day and the work week like scratches the itch. So 15 to 20 is usually my sweet spot. And I'm sure that uh, from what I know, that keeps you very busy. And last time we talked, almost fully booked up in your uh, consulting practice. And uh, you actually made partner not too long ago, which is awesome. Yeah, it's been it's been a really fun ride. And uh, I like to stay busy, you know, and 
when you enjoy what you're doing, you're you're more inclined to put more on your plate. So you, you talked about small and medium sized businesses, but what does a typical business that uh, works with you look like? Well, you know, is there a particular industry that you work with, or you know, what are you seeing the like common denominators of the people that could that benefit from your your type of service? There are some hard criteria need to be operational for at least two to three years. We really don't help people with the 1.0 we need to partner with people who are industry experts. So if you're an architect, you've got to know how to be a good architect. I can't help you with that. But if you know how to deliver best in class offering of whatever it is that you do, I can help you extract that from your head, turn it into an operating system, transfer it to trusted other employees, market it, sell it and scale it in, in a business fashion that applies to every industry. Now, the common character denominators, which I think are the most important, are I, I work well with people who are purpose driven. So if I talk to somebody and they have a goal for their business or after their business that's bigger than just accumulation of wealth, those tend to be the people that I can run really fast with. I can, I can grab onto that, I can understand it, and we can go make that happen. Somebody tells me, you know, the, the Gordon Gecko quote, more, right? Like I just, I just want more. That, that's that's actually harder to to engage with in in my uh, experience because it's like yeah you just playing numbers games and driving the legs to say you won uh, it's, that's less captivating so I, I would kind of move toward the purpose driven uh, individuals on top of the other criteria and for me just like you were talking about it's being purpose driven I think of Victor Frankel's book uh, Man's Search for Meaning he talks about where some people pursue things but oftentimes things need to be ensue rather than be pursued and I think the money is kind of an outgrowth of doing the right things. And like you talked about, when you're purpose driven, the growth and the money can come from that provided you're doing the right things. And it's more of an outgrowth of that rather than something to be pursued directly. And so I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. So from your experience, you know, what are two, one or two common mistakes that you often see business owners make? Most of the errors that I see are conceptual in nature, right? The biggest problem that I see, or the most common problem that I see, is there needs to be a specificity of your vision as a business leader and your mission, how to get there, and your values throughout that journey. I meet with incredibly talented, smart, idealistic business leaders all the time. Their second tier of command often isn't fully uh, in the loop on why we're doing what we're doing, how we're doing it, what we're seeking to accomplish. It's really important to extract that from your head, get specific on it, right? So and there are business targets, right? Hit 10 million in revenue in 2025 or whatever that goal, but, but more importantly, you have to clearly state what we're doing, why we're doing it and what our values are. And every key player on your team has to know that and has to resonate with it. I was working with a nonprofit recently and they're it's a nonprofit, it's purpose driven. I can't tell you who they are, but they had employee, they're grant based. They had employees who were doing great work out in the field, right? The advocacy type stuff. And they weren't in order to bill for the grant that gives them money to stay operational. The employees weren't logging their time. They weren't billing their time for this grant and repeated, right? There's repeated, Hey guys, we're reminder, you need to do this or we're going to be in a lot of trouble. And I said, I was like, that would be like volunteering to pick up litter, spending an afternoon shoving a bag full of litter. And then when you get done, like tearing it open and dumping it, dumping half back out before you put it in the garbage truck. Right? Like, yeah. And that's a lack of alignment. That's a lack of understanding of like what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it. And that's a nonprofit. That's about as purpose driven and alignment based as you can get. Right. And so that that's a microcosm of like, all of that needs to be very clearly communicated front of mind all the time. So everybody's running in the same direction. And a lot of that's assumed. A lot of times business leaders think that because I've come up with this with this great vision and this this plan to execute it, even that like others can infer and, it, you know, they call it common sense. But like that's not common sense. That's alignment. That's communication. And so I, I would I would highlight that as the big thing. And we know what happens when you assume, right? <laughs> 
Exactly. Yeah, that's so that kind of leads to the question is like, you know, what are one or two things that you can do that you, you find is either as a coach or you would recommend business owners do to help bring that alignment? Because I understand that it's, you know, there's there's so many times we're we're assuming something that somebody knows this and you know just because we know it we take so many things for granted so what is the best way that you've seen to kind of you know pull that forward into the business because a lot of times people you know they have a vision statement they put their core values out there but in reality they don't in my experience they don't really mean a whole lot and they don't really transfer down into the company like i think that you're talking about so what is it that really makes that you know visceral for for the rest of the team to really grab hold of in your mind you and i could probably talk for an entire morning about this but i a, a couple points number one that's what informs culture right a lot of a lot of uh it's like a buzzword right now right company culture employee culture and culture needs to be observable not aspirational. And so, you know, if, if you're going to do the work of writing out and systematizing mission, vision, values, you also have to lead from the front. So you have to question as a business leader, am I doing, am I making decisions and am I communicating outwardly according to all of these? And once you do that, then you need to consistently hold your folks accountable to them. And you have to, you have to set the expectation that we are all going to do this and I'm going to lead from the front. The second thing, and I'm gonna shamelessly plug you and what you do here, all new people into the organization, among other things, have to be filtered through that. They don't have to perfectly align and share every single value personally and professionally, but they have to have some sort of common ground and alignment and buy-in to what that mission vision and value set are. And you do a great job. That, that was what I was going to say. I, I appreciate that. Kind of leading into that, I heard something, I think it was actually last night, you know, what are the explicit messages and what are the implicit messages that you're sending? And, you know, an example of that might be, you know, if you're at home and your mom says, hey, you need to eat your vegetables. And she tells you that every day. And that's an explicit message, you know, and then at night, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night and you see her eating, you know, chocolate ice cream. That's an implicit message. And and, you know, and if they're not in alignment, what's going to be more powerful? We often have the, the I, th I think, go back that to the vision statements that you're talking about is it making sure that the explicit messages, your visions and mission, they're written down, they're clear. But then what are you when you're leading from the front, like you talked about, how are you making that real to the team? So they're seeing it every day and saying, is it, OK, there is alignment, there's congruency here. And, uh, you know, that can be difficult when you're faced with all the challenges of business and you're going, okay, how do I really live this out? But, you know, I think that's great advice. Yeah, I'd actually love to elaborate on that just really quickly. I, number one, with the kid, you know, eat your vegetables. The kid's always going to ask why. There isn't alignment on the goal set there. And then if you see mom shoveling ice cream at 10 p.m., we got to know mom's goal too. They might have different goals and you could, you could say that to the kid. But the most important piece beyond that goal alignment is nobody's perfect everybody's gonna make mistakes everybody's gonna have moments of poor judgment and too often ceos and business leaders don't admit when they have those so if a ceo makes a decision that you know they reflect themselves on you know perhaps i should have done that differently or i had to compromise this value for this thing you have to transparently communicate that you have to say hey my bad or like the mom eating ice cream like you know what i had a tough day and i, I like you know, son or daughter, I, I, this is what happens when you, when you fold a little bit and like, I'm going to try to be better, but I fell off plan. I'm not perfect. I'm going to try to work past that. There's like this, um, this ruse that business leaders often have to put on, like, I'm never wrong. And everybody has to be holy. Like the way that you create confidence and trust is by admitting when you're wrong and then pursuing what you think to be right. And so uh, that's that's part of leading from the front. But I think that takes a lot of power and confidence to admit when you're wrong, because if you can't admit you're wrong, you're probably not powerful. And I think this goes to a concept that I've talked with my team quite a bit before about the difference between role and identity. And oftentimes we, you know, we may not perform well in our role, 
but that should not affect who we are as individuals. You know, we really need to be an I, what I call an I-10, you know, with infinite value, even though we might be sucking at our role at the moment, you know, and, but too many times we conflate those, the role and identity, and we can't admit when we're wrong because what would that mean about me? And so I think that that's really important for business owners, and it's really difficult because, as you know, this mental game as far as being able to stay in the right mental framework, you know, most of the time so that you can act and do the things that you need to do on a daily basis for the business. So for sure. I couldn't agree more. Well said. Thanks. So this might be actually that what you talked about in the previous question, but I'm curious, what are the biggest challenges you're currently seeing business owners face? Well, what's one thing that you hear often and you try to solve, right? You can't find good employees, can't find anybody who wants to work, can't find reliable team members or executives or whoever, right? And find is only half of the equation. There is a kind of a reciprocal balance in that you need to find certain things in a team member or whoever, executive, vendor, doesn't matter, in a person. And you need to be able to cultivate, pun intended, <laughs> cultivate certain things within them, right? If you can't find them, you gotta make them. And if you can't make them, you gotta find them. But usually the answer is somewhere in the middle. You have to know what you have to find in a person and then what you have to what you have to cultivate or make or grow within that person. And I don't think most hiring departments are incredibly clear on that. They're clear on the function of the job and the compensation package and you know the office pizza parties and all the other stuff that they try to kind of propagate and like I I, I question some of the critical analysis that goes into those processes for folks. So do you think that's really when I when I look at an HR department, because, again, maybe there's not alignment there with what their job really is? You know, they often see is, oh, it's my job to to bring in the right person. But what the right person really is, is is different to them because like, oh, the right person is the person who has the qualifications and that we think we need. But there's some of these extra things that are difficult to going as well. What do we need to cultivate? You know, so what is our portion of that? You know, we're trying to find the right person as opposed to being the right person kind of in a relationship. I don't know if that makes sense or, if, you know, how would you recommend that companies differentiate and we're able to say is, OK, this is what the right person is. Is, and this is what we're going to need to bring to the relationship to make them the right fit for the team. Is there a way that you can, you know, any guidance that you can give us there? Sure. The most obvious guidance is mission, vision, and values clearly communicated helps. It would be really hard to systematically communicate what the right person is without those things in place. And then there's some strategic reverse engineering that has to happen, right? Anybody who's hiring has to think, how are we different from a culture, soft skill, and hard skill standpoint than the landscape from which we're hiring, right? So if we're a, a law firm, you have to think about what makes you different, culture, soft skill, hard skill, from the academia, the legal academia, the other law firms and similar specializations, perhaps the, the nonprofit and NGO purpose-driven work. Like you have to think about what those differentiating factors are and if you can pull those from external sources, if it's reasonable to think that you can pull those from external sources, like if somebody learned any of that in law school or somebody learned any of that in their first couple of years as a young spunky attorney, and then you, you have to kind of transpose your mission, vision, values through that lens and decide which columns each of those factors fall into. And it's a criminal oversimplification, but that's more or less the mental model. No, I think, I think that's great. You know, basically kind of going through what are your differentiators in the company? What I heard you saying is go through the differentiators in your company and you say is, okay, somebody could foreseeably basically have had this experience and we could go out into the marketplace and find it. For these differentiators, they're unique to our company and we're going to have to train or focus to help them to learn these particular things so that they can perform well in the, in the organization. That's what I heard you saying. And so that oftentimes I think you said, is we often think we're going to go out into the marketplace and we're going to find everything, you know, that's on our list. And the reality is that's probably just not going to happen because we're not really clear on, you know, where those qualities come from and if they can even be found in the marketplace. Exactly. And I would add one more wrinkle to that is like, how are we going to filter and evaluate for all of this stuff, right? 
oftentimes, and you know this well, and you do a really good job of, of creating systems against this, but oftentimes a hirer, especially if it's a really small business where like an executive or a leader is doing it, there's not an HR department, they'll have this list of things that they need to discover in the interview. And then they'll go just like small talk. And you know, they, there won't, there won't be directed questions, right? So if you say, I need to evaluate for applied empathy. You can't get that from just general conversation. You probably have to put them in a situation or ask them a question or give them a hypothetical in a similar way that you would evaluate for some kind of hard skill. And in, in that goes for whatever that list of differentiators that you're looking for in the marketplace is. If you can specifically say, I asked this question, they gave this answer, or, you know, gave them this scenario, and I'm gonna grade their response one through five for applied empathy or for whatever the thing is. But if you have that rubric and you're hyper-focused and then you can equip future people, you know, the HR department, if you hand that list to the HR person and say, hey, one through five evaluation on these things, and we need an average of four, that's gonna, that you're, you're probably gonna miss less. The problem is I think we often think we're better judges of character than we really are. We think we can sit down with somebody for a few minutes and we, we seem to know who they are without having to ask those, those difficult questions and uh, you know going through that very kind of regimented process. And I think that most people feel it's constraining rather than liberating and understanding that once you have that process, it opens you up to you know so many more options because you know exactly what you're going to do in the interview and what the results that it could get for you. And that can be really liberating to make sure that you're going to have the right people in the end rather than just going into the interview and going, oh, you know, hey, how are you doing? You know, and I feel like, oh, they're a nice person and they might very well be a nice person, but do they have the skill set that you're, you're needing? And you really don't know that. You think that they do because they're nice, but that doesn't necessarily lead to the skills that you're needing like you're talking about. For sure. And I don't want to polarize this. If it's really important that you need to like the person in order to hire them, which it, it should be, and that's okay. Make that one of the criteria, like make that one of the lines. So you, you're still going to check that box. Like, Hey, I did or did not trust or like this person, but those are just two lines. And then we've got the rest of the stuff. You should be able to gain the full spectrum. That intuitive sense is important, but it's only one piece. You have to balance it with the data or systems or higher level thinking in any sort. So this is, is kind of on the same topic. What are some of the techniques or some of the, the things you're seeing businesses are doing to recruit and you know just to find these people we talked about you know once you're in the hiring process they kind of come in the door is there anything you're seeing that that's able to help get people in the door there's this concept uh in my opinion that there has to be reciprocity a very smart person i know explained it to me that hiring is is two-way marketing right the the candidate is marketing themselves and too often the company fails to market itself for what it really is an example of this is there's this trend and it's it's now kind of tapering off but there was this trend very up till very recently of like these these assessments right linkedin had assessments like if you're going to apply for a job they'll send you this like litany of whatever things that you have to do and like paragraph answers it's like an act sat sorry and that's cool like it's more work and it, and it filters and it, it, it evaluates whether the candidate is invested in the process enough to go through all these things and check all these boxes but if there's no reciprocity if there's no like okay we're not gonna ask for a cover letter or we're gonna you know we're gonna submit something to you we're gonna you know there should be some kind of trade if the candidates just feel like it's always this uphill battle and you know it, it's the man just throwing stuff down the hill at them they're gonna be less responsive, you're gonna draw less talent. And the same thing goes for the interview process. There is this, this notion that like the interview process keep getting longer and longer, right? Like I, I remember when I came out of college and I was interviewing for like large companies and large institutions, it was like, we do like a like four hours, like a super day, one day though, and then we'd be done. When I have several clients that'll do five, six, seven separate interviews, right? You're you're taking time off of work and time out of your day to do these interviews. And again, there's no, there's no reciprocity. I tell you what, if, and there's, there's companies that are doing this, they'll pay people for practical interviews. They'll be like, hey, we need you to take two hours out of your day and we're gonna do this exercise, whatever it is. And like, it's not a ton of money, but it's like, we'll give you 20 bucks for that, 25 bucks, whatever, whatever the thing is. And even though it's a nominal sum of money, they're not gonna go out and like 
recompensate themselves for the work they missed, they're gonna be like, whoa, I wanna work for that company. Like I wanna, that company has brand equity as an employer now because they have this reputation for treating people fairly. What a concept. So I, I would advise companies to do that type of thing. And it's something that we've done for our staff income because oftentimes we've, you know, had to take a very long test. And I'm like, I don't necessarily know that I would wanna do that. If I wouldn't wanna do it, why would I want anybody else to do it? And I mean, you're going through multiple interviews, you're gonna take this test, or you're basically spending time, we're asking them, hey, can you design this for us? And we'll, we're not going to use their work, you know, to, to resell. It is something that I would be like, why should I spend the time to do this? Are they going to benefit off of me for basically not paying me? And so we've gone through the process of basically paying them like you've talked about. And I think that's really important to understand is like you talked about this reciprocity. What's that relationship? Would you ask your friend to do this? We know without, you know, at some point, not I want to say paying them back, but really thinking and putting yourself in their shoes and saying, is this really appropriate? Yeah, the difference between a friendship and a job interview is that there's relationship equity, right? Like you, you know that I'm asking you to do this, but you know that I would show up in a heartbeat for you. But that doesn't exist. You're a complete stranger in, in an interview process. And so you have to acknowledge that. You have to acknowledge that there isn't any relationship equity. There isn't any brand equity. And their time is money. And if you show that you value somebody's time while they're a prospect, they're going to be way more inclined to think that you're going to value their time as an employee. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. So so this is a, might be something that you, you recommend. How many people have you seen actually do this? Have you seen it, them do it effectively? The, the rest of process. I recommend and it doesn't have to be monetary. I would like to point that out, right? Like there are other there are other means, but very few. I, I would say probably I probably convince a third of my clients to do it. And wow. um, I, that's, yeah, I'm like, amazed. Uh, I'm amazed you got you get a third of, the, of them to do it. You're hitting it out of the park. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty persuasive. But, um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I actually didn't know that you were doing this. I should have I should have mm-hmm. figured given everything that I know about who you are as a person. But uh, it's great that y'all are doing this. So kind of moving on here, you know, with with where we're headed in the world with, you know, there's this, been this debate uh, you know, hybrid, in the office, total remote. How do you see this really working in the next few years and evolving? And, and you know, where, where do you see this headed? In my opinion, the high talent individuals, like the really smart people that are coming out of college, in college, young professionals, they seem to be more freedom oriented, right? They want freedom financially. They want to make enough money to live their life and pursue whatever they want to pursue. They also want freedom of time and geography. And the the jobs that seem to be the sexiest in the labor market are the ones that can offer some combination of those three freedoms. You know, again, when I entered investment banking, it was like, you're trading freedom of time and freedom of location for a lot of money. And that equation doesn't quite work anymore, at least not at scale. And so it's my opinion that we're going to generation by generation, we're going to move toward some sort of equitable balance between those three freedoms and, you know, kind of positioning remote employees, overseas employees, you know, the, the, the folks that you work with and, and employ and, and match, like they are able to gain market share in the labor force right now due to all of the alignment issues that we talked about prior, right? So if if a company cannot figure out how to create alignment in an office, they have no shot of of doing it in, in a remote capacity. But the other side of that coin is, if you can figure out how to create specific alignment, you don't need your people in office. And so I think we're going I think we're going to see this great filtering over time toward those types of trends. And it's one of the things that I've told many people over the years is with remote staffing. I'm not saying take all your people and move them overseas, absolutely not, you know, but what I'm telling is test because this can actually be a great training ground for most people to like you said how do we build alignment with a remote team so we can do it 10,000 miles away overseas cross culturally we can do that you know locally and in our office and but there's a lot less i think risk you know if you have one or two people overseas as opposed to you know a whole office that you can't bring alignment to so i really i appreciate that answer you know but one of the things that i'm i'm really curious about is, is the growth aspect 
How do we get the people that are remote to continue to grow? I think that's one of the benefits that we have being in office. There's lots of things that you see that you don't necessarily are structured. You know, it's not necessarily we have a training all the time, but we're seeing the person next to us and we're picking up a lot from them that is, you know, just built into the process of being in proximity. Do you have some thoughts? How can we go about making sure that the remote or hybrid employees are really gaining the knowledge and experience they're needing to make sure that while they might be able to do the job that they have today, it's not really, you know, where they're going to need to be five years from now. That's my real fear about the remote, the total remote. A couple of things there. Number one, if you're an employer or a business leader, there has to be some sense of stewardship. You're in some capacity, you are responsible for the people who report to you, the people whose paychecks you sign, because you're representing part of their career and part of their life, right? Most people spend more time working during their life than they do anything else other than maybe sleep, hopefully. Mm -hmm. If you're not aware of that, insofar as you can walk out the path for them, and this comes with humility too. You don't need to, you know, if you're running, if you're running a restaurant in a suburb somewhere, you don't need to think that everybody you hire is going to be a lifer. But because the because of that, that doesn't mean you neglect what they should gain from this job, right? If I'm a if I'm running a restaurant, for instance, I'm sitting down with a young kid who's going to come be a server. And I'm saying, what do you want to gain out of this, right? Do you, do you want to work on your communication? Do you want to gain management experience? Do you want to gain supply chain experience? Do you want to know the logistics of operating a restaurant? Like what's interesting about this to you? And if they say in the, in the job interview, like I'm just showing up for a paycheck, I don't care. I'm not hiring them. And so there has to be some element of that, right? Honest disclosure and path creation by the business leader. And then the other thing I want to go back to the in-office versus remote uh, growth. How does one grow? Even if you have that path creation and that that target, right? So if you align on that target and the the desired outcomes of both the employee and the business, the thing that facilitates growth conceptually is feedback. And if you're siloed, you have longer and less reliable feedback loops. So if you align on the goal and the desired outcomes, and then you can institute accurate, beneficial, and regular feedback loops for culture, hard skill, soft skill for that employee, you're, you're going to get everybody gradually running uh, in, in the right direction. That's awesome advice. I love that. So with the rise of technologies like ChatGPT, how do you see AI being integrated into business models of the small and medium-sized businesses that you work with? Yeah, I forget who said it, but somebody gave me a really good metaphor the other day. When calculators came out, math teachers were like, what are we gonna do in class? These kids are gonna be crippled. This thing does everything. And then what happened? We now have eighth graders that know advanced mathematical theory because they don't have to waste their time memorizing arithmetic. I think AI in a way is represented in like that, right? It, it's going to get rid of or exacerbate some of the some of the low skill, high time work. It's gonna gather data quicker than we can as humans. The people who are going to get ahead are going to be the ones who can use that. So in the calculator metaphor, metaphor, the ones who can use the arithmetic and the graphing and mapping functions to get to insights faster. And the same thing goes for AI, in my opinion. It's not about skipping out on the work of data collection. It's about using that to allow yourself to move faster or, you know, get better feedback quicker, whatever that thing might be. Um, and I'd also like to point out that you've probably seen this. If you scroll through LinkedIn or anywhere else, you can tell what blog posts or what job descriptions were written by generative AI, right? Like, it, cause they sound vanilla and washed out. Cause somebody lazy was just like, write me a job description for a plumber. And it's just like this, you know what I'm saying? And so I encourage people to use it, lean into it as a differentiator. And if you don't, if you rely on it as a crutch, you'll get you'll get washed out like the folks who think times tables are impressive still. Cool. So what opportunities do you think businesses might be missing by not leveraging AI effectively? Uh, they're probably spending too many labor dollars doing work that could be completely automated. Even creating systems to teach your entry-level employees how to manage AI for the purposes of 
the business, right? Like if you're if you're missing any part of that circle, you're going to get outrun pretty quick, right? If you still have people manually writing email copy based on a corporate website, you're probably slower than somebody who's having AI generate email copy based on a corporate website and then tinkering with it, right? That, that's the most tangible example I could give. And I think people are afraid of AI and so they kind of stay away from it really than, than trying to understand it. And like you said, you know, sometimes you see these posts and you say, oh, that's been generated. But, you know, what I really feel is, is like you said, it is a tool and how can I make things even better? And you're going to have to put in a little bit more work, you know, you're going to have to give it some differentiators in the text that you're going to be have to be the one who's going to have to give it. So if you're relying it solely on AI, I really see it as this kind of almost like cyborg model. You know, how do we integrate as much as possible? And I know many people are afraid of that, but I, I think that's what I'm seeing is this needs more integration rather than just seeing it as a separate tool. And with that, you're going to get better results. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure you've seen a breadth of specific examples here because I know you guys are you guys are doing automation work as well. And so I, I imagine that you've probably seen the frontline execution or lack thereof uh, with, with with AI and automation management more more than I have. But I totally agree with what you're saying. Well, we're kind of coming to an end here. And I'm just wondering, and I kind of ask everybody some what advice they have for our listeners oftentimes about staffing. But I'm wondering if there's a couple pieces of universal business advice that you kind of would recommend that people could follow that would really take their businesses to the next level. I have two that come to mind. Number one is too often business owners get sucked into the the day-to-day -day management, putting out fires, right? The They'll come out of the crow's nest and start rowing the boat. And that's important and you have to do it sometimes. But I, I encourage owners to think about it in terms of there's, there's tasks that are important and urgent, right? Like solving a customer service issue or an HR problem or whatever the thing is, you know, fixing equipment. And then there's things that are important, but not urgent, like making your mission, vision, values, making your statement or making your like long-term strategy for hiring and path development. Those are incredibly important, but they don't have a deadline on them. And those are the things that get pushed. And so my, my first piece of advice is calendar that time, whatever it is, an hour a week, three hours a week, five hours a week, wherever you can fit it in, maybe one, two hour session every two weeks calendar that time because if you don't put that in your calendar and you don't stick to it you will not do it that's the stuff that gets pushed to next quarter and next quarter and next quarter and and that's usually the biggest game changer when i work with people is that i'm the accountability right so they they set an appointment with me and every week or every two weeks we're doing important not urgent stuff and, and but if you don't have me if you don't have somebody like that you've got to create that structure yourself or you're gonna just spin your wheels. And the second thing is, and again, another kind of plug for you is delegate low cost functions. For instance, bookkeeping. It's incredibly important. I have immense respect for bookkeepers, but if you compare the cost and wages or whatever of a bookkeeper versus the value that an owner could bring to the business by offloading all of that time, it's a no brainer. And too often we have business owners, who, oh, I can do that, therefore I will. Mm -mm, don't do that. Figure out a way to gradually peel low cost functions off of yourself as a business leader or a business owner. Remote staffing is a great way to do that. It's not the only way, but that's, uh, I, I would recommend strategically pursuing that. Awesome. Yeah, I think like you talked about in your first principle, it's the tyranny of the urgent. And, you know, oftentimes I think it's uh, Roger Gerber in the E-Myth talks about, are you working in your business or on your business? And I think that, the, you know, the concepts you're talking about, there are really talking about, you know, working on your business, you know, trying to pull away from the day to day so that you can see this in a, in a larger framework and, you know, you don't get myopic and you're able to really see your business in a different way rather than when you're in the midst of the, of the whirlwind as it is. So. Amen, brother. Well, I really appreciate your insight today. And I was wondering as we close, uh, can you tell us where can everybody find more about you and, and what you do at Cultivate Advisors? Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. I try to post free resources and, and links and such. Even if, even if you don't ever want to directly talk to me, go use some of the free resources that I post on LinkedIn. They're usually directly on our website at Cultivate. Um, they, they can help too. 
That's awesome. And I can highly recommend Cultivate Advisors. I've used them myself. Uh, my sister and the other business has used them as well. So I've had many great experiences with them. They are uh, consummate professionals. And I would highly recommend that if you're interested in consulting and uh, coaching services that you would uh, check them out. So thank you so much, Alex. Really appreciate your time today. Hope you have a, a great rest of the day. Thank you for joining us here on Beyond the Office. And we look forward to seeing you next time. So if you'd like to learn more about remote staffing. Feel free to message us for our free guide, The Seven Deadly Sins of Remote Staffing, and how to make sure that you don't commit them and you're successful in your remote hiring journey.